Excellent. So welcome, everyone. We're very, very excited to have our July keynote. Uh, one of the leaders in the field, truly one of the greatest neuroradiologists in the country, uh, who's generously accepted to be joining us today. Uh, we have mentioned previously that CAM Science goal is to integrate neurosurgery with other sister-related fields. And this is a very relevant and appropriate talk that Professor Pandey has uh, kindly accepted. He's joining us from Western. I'll pass it on to my colleague, Avrar, to introduce him to start with the event. Thank you, Saman. So I'll just take a moment to introduce our illustrious guests. So Dr. Pandey is currently working as the division head of diagnostic and interventional neuroradiology at Western University. He's worked at Western since 2014 after training at Harvard as a diagnostic radiologist with fellowships in diagnostic neuroradiology and interventional neuroradiology. He's currently serving as the associate professor in the Department of Medical Imaging with cross appointments in clinical neuroscience and otolingology. He also serves as the co-director of the Charles Drake Neurovascular Fellowship and is currently the section head of the OMA section of neuroradiology. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Pandey. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. Uh, particular thanks you know, to Saman and, uh, and Abrar for the gracious in, uh, introduction. So listen guys, we, uh, we're lucky to be able to spend some time together uh, I think we're nominally got a time of two hours. I don't mind if it goes longer or shorter, whatever works for you all. Please do not hesitate to jump in, to interrupt me, to stop things. Knowing that this is a group uh, and having reviewed kind of what other talks you guys have had, I thought that uh, a group of aspiring neurosurgeons, that is, I thought that I would show you guys cases that hopefully won't just beat you over the head with like 500 cases. But instead, I thought we were going to divide our time in kind of three big categories, okay? So category one is just a basic survival guide for you guys for dealing with imaging, okay? So it's, what the hell am I looking at when I look at PACs? People use all these stupid acronyms in the MR scanner. How do I know what sequence is what? If I learn what it's like in Hamilton and then I match somewhere in Manitoba, how will I even know what I'm looking at? So it's a survival guide to kind of decode all of the alphabet soup of neuroimaging. Part two, couple cases, not a million of them, really designed to show you not like, hey, here's some cool exotic stuff, but designed to show you how a neuroradiologist on their own is a fairly marginal value in very limited cases. Neurosurgeon on their own, even if they're incredibly confident in the neuroimaging, will also be prone to certain predictable blind spots. And so it's designed to kind of highlight where we are only succeeding by having a collegial collaborative environment and how I profit from that. And then depending on if we have time, Thinking that, you know, for a lot of you guys, one difference for you compared to the people that will train you is for you, you should not be thinking of stroke as like a non-neurosurgical disease, right? For your predecessors, stroke might have been a decompress and other type of neurosurgical management disease. For all of you, you know, many of you might go on to be neurovascular practitioners, in which case stroke is right in your wheelhouse. So I didn't want to show you typical thrombectomies. I picked four or five very unusual cases, some of which highlight in particular what a neurosurgeon can bring to stroke that other disciplines might not be able to. So that's what's on the menu in terms of how we'll spend our time today, those three kind of big categories, and we at least want to hit the first two of them. So this part might be a little dry, but bear with me because I, my understanding is that you guys are mostly aspiring to neurosurgery residencies. And so I hope this stuff won't be too basic, but you can hurry me up if it is. So when we talk about neuroradiology, for you guys in the hospital, looking at all your own imaging, what is on the menu here? Generally, it's gonna be cross-sectional imaging, Generally, that means CT and MRI. No matter what hospital or what clinic you guys all go on to work at, neuro will always be the dominant thing for MR imaging, okay? Even at the least neural hospital, 
neuro is going to be about 40, 50% of every MRI scan ever done. And don't forget the first CT scans ever made are of the brain. So neuro is kind of really playing a central primary role in CT and MRI. CT is more straightforward, so we'll skip past it for now. But on MRI, I want to kind of decode the alphabet, like we're saying. So T1 weighted images. These are part of the standard workhorse practice for every brain MRI you're ever going to see, whether you're in Halifax or British Columbia. Typically, the bare bones of a quote-unquote normal brain MRI is going to be a T1-weighted image, T2-weighted image, something that highlights susceptibility, and there's lots of different names, some kind of diffusion image, and a flare. So those five sequences, totally different bits of data that they are emphasizing, will be the five building blocks of a standard brain MRI. So T1-weighted images is the first one we'll tackle. Typically, these only have a few different flavors. If you think about it like an ice cream, it'll only come with like four flavors. The flavors are either going to be with GAD, without GAD, okay? And sometimes, guys, by the way, it's not so obvious for you to know if it's with GAD or without GAD. It might be labeled like that, so look at that. But don't look at like some blood vessels and say, oh, because they're bright, this is with GAD or without. That's not a good way to do it. One of the most reliable ways to have an sense of the GAD or not GAD is look at the nasal mucosa lining the sinuses. It will enhance, you could say, basically 100% of the time if we gave GAD. If it looks gray, it's not with GAD. I don't care what the rest looks like. If it looks bright, it's with GAD. The only exception to that is extremely unusual if someone had like mucormycosis, basically devascularizing all the nose. And then in a way, it doesn't matter because that person is likely going to be dead quite soon anyways. So you could say 100% of the time, the nasal mucosa will enhance. So that's one flavor, vanilla or chocolate. Second flavor option is fat typically looks bright on a T1-weighted image. And we have different ways and techniques we can nullify that or saturate it out. So you can have fat sat with GAD, fat sat without, and those are kind of all of the flavors. It's not too much more complicated than that. Some of them can be 3D, some of them can be 2D. Just a second here, guys, because somebody is paging me like crazy, and I don't know why they would be doing that. I think it's just an error. So <clears throat> to get back to it, on your actual packs, it might not always just say T1-weighted image when you look at it. It may say things like MP rage if you have Siemens. That's just a term only from a Siemens magnet of what their 3D volumetric T1-weighted images look like. So if you see MP rage in your head, think, oh, that's the T1-weighted image. If you're in a hospital where they have GE, it might say Bravo. If you have Philips, it might say TFE. Those are the three most common MR vendors. So it's going to be one of those three things probably, okay? So don't get confused if you see MP Rage and say, oh no, but I'm looking for the Bravo. It's the exact same thing. It's just a different vendor, okay? Remember, T1 weighting is also the underlying technique behind lots of other things we look at. So for you guys, when you're looking at uh, aneurysms, and we're looking at an MRA or time of flight MRAs, those are acquired with underlying T1 weighted principles. So the same things that look bright and dark on the T1 weighted image will also look bright and dark on a time of flight MRA. Here's an example of what it looks like. Typically in adults, we're going to mostly be talking about adults today. The white matter is going to look pretty white. The gray matter is going to look darker. That's pretty reliable way to tell I'm looking at a T1-weighted image. A pretty bad way to tell is if you say, if I say, Abrar, what are you looking at? And he says, oh, the fat looks a little bright. I think that's a T1-weighted image. That's not good. Because remember, uh, although it is bright on T1-weighted image, like I just said, it's also bright on every T2-weighted image, unless you choose to sat it out. That's not reliable. If you said, oh, the no, the fluid looks dark here in the ventricles. I think that's a T1-weighted image. Okay, again, bad guess. 
Although it is true, that's also true on a flare. So you need those things to be true. And then also just say the white matter looks hyper intense to the gray matter in an adult with normal myelination. That tells me I'm looking at a T1 weighted image. Here, I'm looking at the nasal mucosa, by the way. Hey, can you guys see my mouse when I'm moving it here? Okay, good. So here I'm looking at the nasal mucosa, and that might be a way I can tell if we gave GAD or didn't give GAD. Here's just a little pearl I wanted to leave. I know this is not about the alphabet soup part, but I just thought for your guys' level, this would be very helpful. One of the things that sucks as you're starting to learn medicine is, I remember in med school feeling like for large periods of time, all I'm doing is just memorizing what feels like arbitrary lists. And sometimes the arbitrary lists are ridiculously long. So I like to focus my mental energy when I was learning on lists that are like short and high yield, and then I can really know fluently and then try to leverage that instead of a lot of lists that are really long and less specific. So the things that look bright on a T1 weighted image is a really, really short list. So this is a good one to memorize for a neurosurgeon. Fat, some types of blood like methemoglobin, densely proteinaceous things. So like, for example, uh, Samana, I hope you don't mind if I pick on you here, if you take off your microphone. What happens if I saw a little ball? It's super crazy bright on a T1 weighted image, and it was sitting right inside the third ventricle in a patient who had positional extreme headaches and they might have some hydrocephalus. So there's a little so, ball. Right. It could be the, the, the shunts from the drain that could possibly be there. Uh, it could also be some form of metal. Usually things that are very bright are going to be something that's external to the patient. It could be also part of the valve. They have like yeah, so, but we're giving an example here of protonaceous things. So when there's a, a little tiny ball sitting inside the ventricle and it's insanely bright, Typically, that'd be a classic story for someone who has a colloid cyst. Yeah. Colloid cysts become very, very proteinaceous, and they look to our eyes usually really bright on a T1 weighted image. So fat, super proteinaceous stuff, met hemoglobin, melanin. So remember, if someone had a melanoma met, okay, or if they had melanosis, and then gadolinium. So that's pretty much it. Some types of mineralization I listed there for you, it's extremely rare. So really there's five things. Five things, even the dumbest ones of you guys can remember five things. Uh, I'm kidding, of course, but you know that's how my brain works is that this is a short list, it's high yield, it's a good one to just tuck in your head. When you're stuck on rounds one day trying to impress somebody or help a patient, you can come back to this list, I hope. Okay, T2 weighted image. So remember, we said there's five basic sequences that are part of most brain MRIs, and we've covered T1-weighted images. And I reminded you, if nothing else, that something might be called MP-RAGE or BRAVO or TFE, and those all mean a type of T1-weighted image. Now we're on to T2-weighted images. Usually on most packs, it's just going to be called T2. So this one is usually pretty easy for you guys to find. Sometimes you can acquire it with some different techniques that are specific to MR physics. You'd have to know more about MR physics to understand this. And But the only reason I'm even mentioning it to you is not to bog you down in physics, but just to give you a survival guide that if I happen to be in McGill and at McGill, it might say blade or propeller, that could also mean the TT weighted image. Because what blade and propeller are they're techniques of how we sample the data in space that allow us to acquire some motion correction. And we apply those commonly to T2 weighted images. So some hospitals might be called T2. Some hospitals might be called blade or propeller. It all just means the T2 weighted image. This is a picture of how we sample the data in a rotating overlapping fashion so that we oversample the central area of the data, which encodes a lot of the information about physical space. And we undersample the outside of the data. And you can see on the top of the image, a before and after of applying that blade technique and what it does to correct for patient motion. So 
again, the physics don't matter. This picture doesn't matter. What matters is that if you pull down a long list on packs, when your chief resident says, review the scan and you have five minutes and we have 40 patients to look at, you know right where to go to get the info you need. Okay, T2-weighted imaging, we also use for extreme T2-weighted situations and when we want volumetric data. So I just gave some on an example of a case where I said, what if there was a colloid cyst and it was in the third ventricle, it was causing some obstructive hydrocephalus, et cetera. Well, someone might come back to me and say, you know, I plan to do an endoscopic de debulking of that colloid cyst uh, intraventricular. Um, and depending on how much I get out or not, I might also want to open up the floor of the third ventricle. So those types of situations, we might want to get some pre-planning imaging and at almost every center, that will include some 3D volumetric T2 weighted images. And depending on the type of magnet you have, it will have a label kind of like this. So either Fiesta or Kiss or Cube or True FISP. If you guys want to, I'll hang with you after. We can talk about what do each one of these stand for? Why did they name it that? But for now, I think the important part is that you don't trip if you're at a hospital that says Fiesta and then you do an away rotation because you want to impress everybody in Toronto and it says kiss and you look like an idiot because you don't remember what's what. Just have this list and say they're all equivalent from my standpoint. OK, that's a reasonable way to think about this. Here's an example of what these images look like. They're extremely T2 weighted. So gosh, I can see with beautiful detail, cranial nerve seven, cranial nerve eight, I can make out these turns of the cochlea, I can see the septation in the cochlea and look at the medialis. But what, because it's so heavily T2 weighted, the consequence I'm paying is that if I look inside the brain, if I look at the pons in the middle cerebellar peduncle and the left cere cerebellar hemisphere, it's all just one uniform blob of gray. So if you're asking me if there's a little bit of edema in here, I have no idea. But if you're asking me, can I delineate the course of the seventh cranial nerve? Yes, with extreme detail. So again, the tool is not failing here. We just have to know where and how to apply that tool. Okay, T1 weighted images, T2 weighted images. We got three more to go. Next one, FLARE. FLARE stands for Fluid Attenuated Inversion Recovery. Inversion recovery is a type of pulse we can shoot at the data. And we can match that pulse to attenuate signal from different tissues. So we don't have to do it to fluid, but that's the, what we do when we're doing it in flare. So we're trying to attenuate the signal from the fluid by nullifying it with this pulse. Now flare, you can do that and have it be a T1 weighted flare. In fact, at most hospitals nowadays, when we get a T1 weighted image, we're also adding flare because we think it makes the picture look nicer. But in everyday parlance, everywhere in the world, if you're talking with your staff nurse surgeon and they say, did you look at the flare? They don't mean the T1 flare, they mean the T2 weighted flare. We don't even say it, it's so common. So if it just says flare, we mean T2 flare. So remember earlier, I said, hey, if all you do is look at the fat, and I was picking on a bra there, if he says, oh, the fat's bright, it's a T1 weighted image. Well, the fat's bright on both of these images. That's not gonna help him. If he said, oh, but the fluid looks dark in the ventricles, it's dark in the ventricles on both. But remember we said, in a normal adult, white matter looks bright on the T1 weighted image compared to the gray matter. And it's the opposite for a conventional flare. So out of these two, obviously the image on the right is the flare. The image on the left is the T1 weighted image. Again, guys, this is basic, but this is just about give, creating survival tools. So we've covered T1 weighted, T2 weighted, flare. We got two left. One of them is the one that I said is the susceptibility sensitive one. Here's where there'd be a big diversity of labeling, depending on what hospital you're at, what magnet they use, and but the concept is going to be the same. 
Some people will call it MPGR. Some people call it GRE. Some people call it T2 star. Those all ultimately mean the same thing. You're taking a problem in MRI, okay? So in MRI, one problem is you have substance that are either diagmagnetic or paramagnetic, like iron, like calcium. What diagmagnetic and paramagnetic substances do is they distort the magnetic field, not only where they are, but around them. So if you're just a happy proton in water and you're near a proton from iron, your water proton signal is going to get distorted. That's a problem. It's an artifact. But in these sequences, we're leveraging that problem and artifact to our advantage. We're saying, actually, we want to accentuate the artifact. That will help me find microscopic little bits of hemorrhage that maybe someone is telling me, I believe it is there. This is a horrible traumatic injury. This patient was in a bad car accident. You're telling me the CT is normal. I'm telling you my patient is profoundly abnormal on their neurological exam. And Saman and I might find common ground between his exam and my quote unquote normal CT scan by looking on an MRI, accentuating this artifact, and finding innumerable little micro hemorrhages from a traumatic axonal injury, right? So that's taking a problem that we know about based on MR physics and leveraging that problem to help us clinically. A much more sensitive way of doing that is now called SWI, which is widely in place and probably at every single one of your hospitals. But if we had talked about this 10 years ago, it would have been kind of maybe borderline cutting edge, actually more like 15 years ago. Susceptibility weighted imaging takes advantage of the same issue, but it allows us to see things a little bit more deeply because we're not just looking at how much susceptibility there is. We can also measure in what direction is it distorting the magnetic field? Because it turns out blood and iron distort the magnetic field in one direction. Calcium distorts it in the other direction. So that adds something that we could not do before with just MPGR or GRE. But like everything in the world, when you get all these more tools and you can answer more subtle questions and this, it means that the flip side of that is when you go to look at a study on PACs, when you're trying to pre-round on patients, you're like, shit, what used to be five things is now a list of like 40 things on PACs. And that's because here's what you might see in a susceptibility weighted image. The one just called SWI, we're used to that. The ones that I labeled as SWI MINIP or lowercase MIP, that's taking the same data and only picking the darkest parts of that data to show. And so what it does is it takes those black micro dots of hemorrhage and accentuates them so they're easier to see. And then that phase and magnitude data that I just said, which might help us distinguish a diagmagnetic substance from a paramagnet. So those are more fringe sequences that we might only use in very specific scenarios. Here's an example of what SWI images look like. The image on the left is the regular SWI image. The image on the right is the identical data where we just made it into a thicker slab and said, don't show me everything in the slab, just show me the darkest spots. So what it does is it makes all the black things really pop. This is the exact opposite of what we do when we look at a MIP, you know, when we're trying to make images look very thick. And here's an example. This is a brand new Siemens scanner from my hospital that's maybe four months old. Uh, and this is what it will look like if you buy a Siemens magnet. It just looks like all an insane amount of numbers and capitalized things and letters. And it's very annoying. And then you have to calm down, look at it a little more carefully, and it becomes reflexive and you can just get what you want. So again, mag. Now we know, oh, that's the magnitude of how much susceptibility there was. Fa. Now we know, oh, that stands for the phase and it tells us what direction things are being distorted as. SWI, that's just the conventional SWI. And then the lowercase MIP, that's the MINIP. So the last one then is the diffusion. To understand this, 
it's very difficult to explain because this comes labeled as crazy things in most packs. And you really will never fully understand it unless you have a little bit of understanding of the physics. So I'm sorry about that, but that's why I say this one to the end. So in MR, when we're doing diffusion weighted imaging, we will apply a gradient to sensitize our info, how, what we're reading to the diffusion properties. And that diffusion sensitizing gradient, we call in MR physics, the B value. So if we say B zero, that means there is almost no sensitization to the diffusion. We're just making a baseline picture using different techniques that are commonly accentuating the T2 weighted properties of the image. You need to have that because you need to know what the baseline is. Then we ramp up the B value and we typically acquire one called B1000. And that will now tell us some diffusion sensitive info. If we only did the B1000 and got rid of the B0, then we'll never know when we look at it what bright things are because of true diffusion problems versus what bright things are because there's some underlying issue with the tissue that has nothing to do with diffusion. So the B0 acts almost as a control and the B1000 acts then as like the intervention group to let us see the diffusion characteristics. The other issue is that that only works for the direction that you happen to be reading that info. So AP, for example. But when we're thinking about, say, a stroke or when you guys as budding neurosurgeons are wondering, is that a postoperative abscess with pus in there? You don't care if there's pus that is slowing diffusion in one direction. You care about three-dimensional pus because you have to go in and get that all out. So to get a data set that is not directionally dependent, we have to acquire that B1000 in the AP direction, in the transverse direction, in the cranial cauda direction. And the more and more directions we acquire it as, the more and more spatially independent or isotropic data we end up getting. So that's why when we look on PACS, if you look at the bottom here, we'll see that sometimes the diffusion weighted images are just called diffusion or diff, that's pretty obvious. Sometimes it's called ISO. That's because it's a combo of all those different directions to give you isotropic data of the diffusion abnormalities. And sometimes it's called the trace because we're combining all the images and it's based on a T2 technique and they call it a T2 trace. You'll also see something called the ADC map when you look on PACS. And that's basically a way to say, if I see something bright on the diffusion, is it because it's really a diffusion problem or because of an underlying issue? And the ADC is a way to take that and control for that data. And we needed that B0 map to generate it. So here's an example classically of what it might look like if someone had a stroke, for example. The DWI shows that that lesion is very, very bright in the operculum. And on the ADC, we can see that it's very, very dark. That is an example of something that's not a problem of the T2 weighting or the technique. It's a problem of the tissue that's truly showing restricted diffusivity of water protons. And we know that happens when there's been cytotoxic injury. We can now infer that this person had a stroke. But we won't be able to understand that at all if we don't have at least a tiny understanding of the physics. So again, let's look at a Siemens magnet. Okay, this is probably the most common vendor in Canada. What does it actually look like? Okay, look, you got one sequence that has 640 images. What the hell is that? Well, now maybe we can understand it. We could say, well, part of it might be the B0. Let's say they did 32 slices through the head. That would be about normal, the B0. And then you told me they got to do the B1000. But you also said the B1000 in one direction isn't good enough. And you told me they repeat it in direction after direction after direction after direction. So take the number 640, divide it by 32, and you can say, oh, that's evenly divisible by 20 times. So that tells me we did one B0, and then we did 19 different directions of B1000 data, and that let us generate this ADC map and this T2 trace. And so if I'm in a rush and I'm on PACS, 
I can just go right to this T2 trace and look at it. If it's normal, I can just move on. If it's abnormal, I can go to this ADC and understand it. And if there's ever any problems with the data, we can always go back to the source with this big one at 640. But if you don't understand that, and if you're sitting in a busy clinic trying to help out, and you're just looking at all of them, well, now you just wasted time going through 640 bits of data, and you had no idea what the hell you were looking at. So that's why we spend this time tonight trying to decode it and getting those tools. Let's stop now because we're about 25 minutes in. CT at least. That's easy. There's no T1, T2. It's just a map of how much everything is attenuating x-rays. Okay. But even CT is getting more and more complicated. And this is the world you guys are all inheriting. So look at this. I took a screen capture of a CT scan that I saw the other day from a hospital nearby us in Chatham. This is an actual scan at Chatham that they acquire on every one of their stroke patients. Look how many series there are from one stroke study. Okay. The where I'm putting the arrows are the only ones I think you actually needed to look at if you're just trying to get a quick idea. But this isn't even it, guys. This is the same study of the same patient. And so is this. Okay. All of these images are from one patient and one study. So bottom line here, at this point, I know I've probably taken you as far as I can take you. At your home institution, and remember your home institution is gonna change at all these different parts of your career. You have two choices. You can scrape by, always be frustrated, be 20% inefficient, over the whole seven, eight years of your residency. Or you can spend 20 minutes the first day you're there, learn what type of scanners are at your hospital, learn how to decode this. If it's annoying, sit down with a radiologist and say like, hey, walk me through this for 20 minutes and then save an extra two minutes for every other MR you're gonna look at for the next seven, eight years, okay? I think it's pretty obvious what's better. Um, and hopefully this gives you a little bit of a tool guide so you don't feel so intimidated to start that conversation. Okay, let's pivot and just for the next maybe five, 10 minutes, talk about beyond the basics. Remember, all we covered so far are the five basic sequences of a standard vanilla brain MRI. But as you can see on this picture, this is an example of a young patient who had a high-grade glial neoplasm where we're now applying all sorts of other techniques like perfusion, et cetera. So advanced quote unquote MR imaging will include things like MR perfusion and MR perfusion itself. It's not like CT perfusion. There is only really one way to do CT perfusion. We can post-process the data. We can fit the data to different models, but really at the end of the day, you inject contrast with iodine in it, you wait, and then you keep taking more CAT scans. That's it. MR perfusion is radically different techniques from each other, and you at least have to be a little familiar with them. So the base description is ones that use GAD and ones that don't use GAD. Without gadolinium, there's one called arterial spin labeling. This is really, really important because remember, many patients might not be able to get gadolinium. And then arterial spin labeling becomes a great option. The other thing is that contrast enhanced techniques, the most common one is called DSC or dynamic susceptibility perfusion. Without getting into every detail of it, that it's right there in the name. The technique relies on the fact that gadolinium, as it washes through a tissue in the brain, induces some susceptibility changes in the parenchyma. And we take advantage of that to make a perfusion map. Okay, but remember, you guys are all going to be neurosurgeons. So let's say you operate on a GBM. Let's say the patient goes through temozolomide and radiation, like a standard kind of protocol. And let's say six months later, there's some new regrowth, and you come to us and say, is it, is it actual progression? Is it pseudo progression? Is this radiation necrosis? What am I looking at? And we say, oh, let's do some perfusion and check it out. 
But now what happened? You've already been in there. You've already cut that area. You've cauterized things. There's been blood products. No matter how beautiful and elegant your surgery is, you've now caused some problems that are going to cause susceptibility. And if our perfusion technique needs susceptibility changes to find things, gosh, it's hard to tell what the hell you're looking at. So that's another way where arterial spin labeling, which is a totally different technique and does not rely on that, may offer some advantages. So you don't need to know everything about each one, but just the highlights of them so that you know when you're the one picking which ones you want, when might I want this one, when when I want that one. And remember that in the brain, we don't want to think of it. This is why all of you guys want to be neurosurgeons. And you don't want to be a hepatologist or something because the liver is so boring. In the liver, if there's a tumor and if it's hypervascular, it just enhances. That's it. There is no hypervascular malignant tumor of the liver that does not enhance. Everything does. In the brain, there's an extra layer of subtlety, the blood-brain barrier. Okay? So you can have a high-grade tumor that's not enhancing very much. So enhancement is not the only thing we look at. And that's another place where perfusion can really help. And it matters what perfusion technique you're using. And you have to know about that. That's part of what makes the brain and neuroimaging kind of fun. Here's an example. Okay. A paramedian mass just over the corpus callosum. On the top left, you see there is some enhancement there for sure. It's there. But now look, guys, on the middle and bottom images. This is a DSC perfusion and arterial spin labeling perfusion. Can I convince you at least it's way more obvious where the hypervascular tumor is on the perfusion than it is on the GAD images. So it's just an illustration that enhancement is not the same thing in a one-to-one -one ratio as perfusion when it comes to the brain. Now, there's also MR spectroscopy, and by now, it kind of will be kind of testing your guys' patience. So I'll just maybe hit pause here, a longer pause. I've noticed people trickling into the talk. I'm looking at the clock at the same time and seeing that even with the intro, we're now about 35 minutes in. We've covered all the basics of the five kind of the standard brain MR sequences. We've covered some of the nomenclature. And then we gave a glimpse of some of the basics of advanced MR, like spectroscopy, more just headline stuff. Let me pause and say, and there doesn't have to be, but at least give a chance. Are there any questions so far? Anything that you have been feeling uncomfortable with when you're looking at images at your own center? Anything that I'm explaining too quickly or not clearly enough? Okay. You can also dump anything in the chat if you'd like to, which I'm just realizing I've kind of missed until now. So good job, Muhammad. That flare was the one on the right. Okay. I'm going to skip past then the rest of the kind of advanced MR techniques. And if people want to have spent more time on these or come back to them, we can easily do it. But I think I've kind of kept you with the dry stuff long enough. So let's stop now and mix in some cases so that they don't lose you entirely. This first set of cases we're going to look at are again, just mostly, they're all cases from my real practice. And they're all designed to illustrate the value that I get from being with you all, okay? So where you all are, I assume you're all spread out around the country, right? You're not all just from one institution? Okay, so where you're all around the country, you'll have a huge diversity of experience. Some of you, in your journey towards neurosurgery so far, may have never even seen the neuroradiologist. Some of you may have met the neuroradiologist and think they're a, he or she is a jackass. Some of you might have met the neuroradiologist and found some comfort or someone to turn to and help problem solve. Obviously, we want to be closer to the latter one. 
Now, uh, to give you a sense of my practice, although we have office space and private spaces to read from, for example, right now I'm in my home, in my home office, but I believe very strongly that this is becoming an out-of-date point of view among some radiologists, that our, our job is heavily contingent on what service we are able to provide to all of you, and that that service is strongly better or benefited by being actually present to you guys in a reliable place. So I do not like having a practice where all of my friends in neurology and neurosurgery and ENT have to read some website, say, oh, they're in this office or they're in their home or I have to go to this place today. I want there to be a common reading room. I want it to be close to the ORs and I want it to be where Whoever is on that day, if I'm the epileptologist, I can just go to that room and I'll find someone that I can chat and talk to and not be berated all the time. And the reason I want that is A, because I think that's how I can offer some at least value to a patient, but also just selfishly. It radically improves my ability to look at a case and to not sound like a complete moron. And I'm going to give you an example of that now. So here's a case we saw just a few months ago. 59-year-old lady, opera singer. She was now working at Western, and she was a professor in vocal music. So she went to our urgent neurology clinic with eight weeks of this lightning-like pain at the right back of the tongue, the tonsillar area, the palate, and the ear, all unilateral. What was interesting was when the neurologist chatted to her, she could identify certain speech patterns, certain tongue movements that would trigger these lightning episodes that would last 15, 20 seconds and then resolve entirely. Now, construction is happening at MR. Remember, I showed you some magnet uh, drop-down menus, and I said, oh, these are just new scanners. In fact, we just put in a 3T scanner a week and a half ago. So because this construction was happening several months back, the imaging was ordered at LHSC. But the patient had also been having these issues and had seen her family doctor who knew about the construction, who said, we'll just get the MR in Mississauga. It'll be way faster. So we have two things that we can compare. We have a natural great experiment. Now, the clinical history I described for you, because you guys are also highly educated, so focused on neuro. And I had the privilege of working with people like you in the neurology and neurosurgery side here in London. And that kind of person is going to see this patient and say, oh, this sounds like a glossopharyngeal neuralgia. Okay. But look what history is sent from the family doctor, who, of course, has to, the family doctor is not a dumb person. They have to deal with such an incredible breadth of pathology, have such unbelievable time pressure that they say throat pain and some tinnitus. Okay. So two groups of radiologists get imaging recs. I happen to be in a very privileged position. I'm not smarter than anybody. I just happen to be in a lucky spot. And so the history I get says, likely right glossopharyngeal neuralgia. Is there an underlying mass enhancement or vascular compression? The scan that my doc colleague, who's maybe a teledoc working remotely in some godforsaken closet somewhere, reading a magnet in Mississauga, minting money, gets one that says throat pain and tinnitus. Well, it's not going to be a big surprise to you all that one is going to produce a pretty shitty outcome, even though the person reading it is a highly educated person, no doubt. So here's looking at this image. Now, remember, we just looked at these guys, right? So this is another reason I showed it. This is a T2 weighted image. And this is one of those heavily T2 weighted ones. Remember, we used words like kiss or BFFE or fiesta or space or cube depending on the vendor and technique. So this scan is initially reported as normal. And I'll be honest, that is the correct reading of it. It should say normal. If a radiologist starts calling things on this with the kind of history they were given, you guys will be going crazy and will be sick of us because we'll be overcalling everything. But let's compare this to the benefit that I had in the series I saw. Similar technique. But now, I can, now that you gave me that history, my eyes are locked right on this little flow void. That's a loop of pica. I know that. And I can see that loop of pica, boom, right here. 
pinging exactly at the nerve root entry zone of cranial nerve nine. Now that's a reasonably common finding. Like I said, if you started calling that on every scan, you're going to look like a moron. But if you call it on a scan where you got that history, you've completely clinched the diagnosis. And not only that, now I've been able to give my neurosurgical colleagues guidance for what they now need to do operatively. Now this is a microvascular decompression. Now this is placing a little pledget between the artery and the nerve, and it's quite clear what to do. So the reason I show this case is not to criticize a family doctor and absolutely not to criticize a community radiologist who had to read the scan. But it's to point out that whether it's me or the community rad, we're never going to make this diagnosis if we'd like to hold our nose in the air, to work in isolation, and to not live and breathe with you all. If I get to live and breathe with you all and get good histories and talk to each other and see each other in the hallway and hear about this case you were wondering about, this flips entirely and becomes a ridiculously easy and straightforward diagnosis to make. So here's the interpretations. We've already hit this over the head. And the patient got the surgery and is going on to do quite well. Here's a second case. Right proptosis, diplopia, getting worse over months. Got a scan at an outside hospital with a gigantic sphenoid wing mass. The history or the report says likely meningioma. They get sent to my colleague, Dr. Head here in skull Basin neurosurgery in London. Workup gets done, no history of malignancy, no mass anywhere else in the body. It doesn't look like a mat. Maybe it's a meningioma, it's a huge thing. Matt, just go resect it, okay? See if you can get this person's vision back. Here's the MR scan that Dr. Heb ordered here at UH. You can see I left the labeling on to say University Hospital so you would see where it is. So I'll scroll through it for you. By the way, this is a flare. The fluid is dark. The fat looks bright. That's irrelevant. The white matter is darker than the gray matter. This is the flare. So look, huge mass here, centered at the sphenoid wing, bulging into the orbit. This is pretty obvious. And you can see here, look, there's a fiducial marker on the skin. So this was acquired as a preoperative plan because Dr. Hebb was planning to go and operate. And that's totally appropriate. Here's the T2 weighted image, gigantic lesion. We've all seen lots of sphenoid wing meningiomas. Here's the T1 weighted image with GAD. By the way, let me stop here. Look at this nasal mucosa. It's super bright, isn't it, compared to the brain? So this is a T1 weighted image with GAD. And look at this, enhancing so avidly. We know meningiomas enhance avidly. Oh, look at this, in communication with the dura. Maybe it's a little dural tail or something like that. But Dr. Hebb is a cherished colleague of mine. He is nothing if not a meticulous person. I'm invoking him by name specifically here knowing that Canada is a small community and many of you would have heard or worked with him. And I have to give him a hell of a lot of credit. The guy does not overlook details. The guy has zero ego about thinking, I am God's gift to imaging. I know how to look at everything by myself. I don't ever need anybody's help. Frankly, he's an intelligent, bright guy. He does not really need my help for the imaging, except in very fringe cases. So if I'm giving him the cold shoulder, every time if he comes down to the reading room, if I say, can you remain silent while I finish my thought? And just in subtle ways, if I'm being kind of a jerk, well, then you know that 5% of the time I can actually help him. Maybe he doesn't even want to seek that help. But I try to be receptive and helpful to him if I can. And he also is a very curious, meticulous guy. So guess what he brought with him? He says, hey, you guys just imaged my patient. I'm going to go to the OR. They came with their CD, and the CD has a CAT scan that was not done locally and is not available electronically. Do you mind if we just spend five minutes to double check it first? 
So that's your opportunity as a neurosurgeon or as a neuroradiologist to say, we'll be better if we do this together and do it quickly. So let's look at that CAT scan. Here's the CAT scan from another hospital. And take a look at this. It's incredibly lytic. It's hardly invoking any type of hyperostosis that we see in meningiomas commonly. This does not seem right. Here it is on a bone window to illustrate that point. So then you start to say, hold on a sec. If you had left me on my own, Matt, Dr. Head, I would have reported this as definitely meningioma or overwhelmingly likely a meningioma. Move on, go to the OR, God bless you. But now because you showed me this, I'm able to go past my own level and my own limitations as a neuroradiologist, where we say, is this really the diagnosis? So then we put our heads together and say, let's change the plan. How about we cancel the OR? How about you make them my patient for a little while? And why don't I bring them to the CT scanner and put a needle inside of it? So there you can see I'm doing a biopsy. This was in April of this year. And pretty predictably, this comes back actually as a plasma cytoma. So now it's a plasma cytoma. The whole pathway changes. This doesn't make sense as a neurosurgical patient. This patient needs to get a bone marrow biopsy. This patient needs to go to the hematology service and got put on Cyborg D chemotherapy. This person needs a stem cell transplantation, is now currently on lenalidomide for maintenance therapy. So again, on my own, I'm issuing a removed, detached, maybe arrogant report saying, yeah, go ahead. On Matt Hebb's own, he might be in the OR doing a surgery on a thing that's better treated with chemotherapy. Together, we are able to transcend both of our boundaries. And I'm so grateful to have him as a colleague to give me that chance. Okay, just a quick companion case. Um, because a meningioma, that is it a meningioma? This is a case that I saw with Joe Megacy, one of our neuro-oncology surgeons. Again, I'm only picking recent examples, guys. If you want over the course of my career, I have three or four examples like this every week where I benefit from my colleagues and hopefully vice versa. 68-year-old woman, mild headaches for several months, memory difficulty, personality changes. But Dr. Megacy is a meticulous neurosurgical clinician and surgeon. He doesn't just pride himself solely on operating. So when you come see him in clinic, he's taking an in-depth history. He's reviewing it. And what does he dig up? Oh, you didn't tell us. You have a remote history of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma from 18 years ago. Let's look at this study. Big extra axial mass, hyperdense, easy to see, causing lots of change and mass effect on the brain below it. And look, I, I rudely in this case clipped for you exactly what was on the history. You can see here's the MRI from Woodstock that the patient came with. T2 weighted image, extra axial mass, very clear. T1 weighted image, pre-GAD, quite dark. Post-GAD, enhancing avidly. Has all the things you want for a meningioma in some ways. But very, very bright on diffusion. Some meningiomas can be. Not all of them are. That's kind of a subtle hint. What the heck is going on? The other thing is, Meningiomas very commonly will grow along the dura. They can invade the sinuses as well. We know that. And that'll be the, you know, something important for all of you as budding neurosurgeons. But they don't commonly permeate right through the falks equally on both sides. That's a little funny. So some permeative pattern of growth, some striking prolonged diffusivity. My antennas are up. Something is wrong here. But if I'm on my own, I don't know how to convey to you in my report that I feel 5% uneasy with the diagnosis. And look at what the scan said here. Here's the history that was given to my colleague in Woodstock and out in the community. It just says, newly diagnosed meningioma. What the heck is the radiologist going to say in that case? They're going to say, large mass, just like you said on the CT, probably a large meningioma. 
but I have the benefit of Joe Megacy, who I spend time with. I see him three, four days a week. We talk to each other. When he has a patient in clinic, even though he has a busy day, he will stop his clinic and say, let's go and talk. Something weird might be going on. And he tells me that history. And I'm, I don't think so then, Dr. Massey. If, that, if we are adding in the part where there's a remote lymphoma, I think this is a dural lymphoma and not a meningioma. And of course, it changes the operative approach. Now we're not trying to get rid of it. We just need to sample that. It is a lymphoma. Patient goes to hemoc, is getting outpatient treatment as we speak. On my own, I might fall down there. Dr. Megacy is smarter and more experienced than me. He might not fall down on his own there. But I think he would probably agree that we're stronger together in that situation. Okay, last couple cases kind of in this tranche as we kind of round off the first hour here. So I want to make sure we have some time for chatting or we can let you out early if we can. Female, this is my patient, guys, to illustrate. So one thing, I let me just hit pause here. I don't know if we covered this. Um, I think we did. You know, I was lucky enough to do fellowships in neurosurgical departments, not with the radiologists. Uh, and that's where I learned uh, how to treat endovascular uh, approaches to cerebrovascular pathologies. And part of now having the luck to be able to care for patients with aneurysms and fistulas, et cetera, is that you cannot be like a radiologist of 20 years ago where I'm just doing the technical part of the procedure. And hey, Mel Bolton, my friend and colleague in neurovascular, you deal with everything else. That's not a good relationship for us to have. We have to also participate in their care, follow them up, run our own clinics. And I, that's a big part of my practice. And when I'm in that practice, I feel in a way closer to you all than to my radiology colleagues when I have that hat on. So let me give you an example of my own failures when I'm not being the radiologist. So this 63-year-old woman was first seen by my mentor and colleague, Dr. Lowney. And 2015, he had detected a large ophthalmic aneurysm, 18 millimeters, and it was calcified. And you know, you guys know from the operative world, these calcified aneurysms can be very difficult to clip. You can have sort of a beach ball type thing where your clip may slide on and off of it. Patient had a history of a vasculitis. So Dr. Lowney said, you know what? I don't wanna clip this for all those calcifications. Let me go ahead and coil this. I think it's of a size that it should be treated. So he coiled it. And it was pretty good, but it was a tricky coiling, as many gigantic aneurysms are. And ultimately, he had to do two other coilings, okay, in 2016, because the coil pack was compressing, the aneurysm was filling at the base, had to do two more treatments. And at some point, he introduced me to the patient and said, hey, can you, do you want to collaborate together? Because he's a gracious, wonderful mentor. Um, I cannot speak more highly of him. And uh, we said, why don't we try a flow diverting stent? Because we've tried this coiling approach. It's not working. And so I placed a flow diverting stent uh, in 2018. So let me show you my aneurysm treatment in 2018. Here is a gigantic coil pack, as you can see. Here's the loose parts of the coil pack down below. There it is on a lateral projection. And so here you can see we're approaching it and we've placed a flow diverter. And you can see here the edges of my flow diverter sitting very, very nicely in the ICA and leading to some stagnation in this basal part of the aneurysm. So when you place a flow diverting stand for an aneurysm, this is a nice kind of result to see early on. And usually is a good marker that we're going to head in the right direction here. So... I'm so happy with myself. I've got this great mentor who I look up to, who I'm trying to impress. I've got this patient who's been suffering and that's the most important thing. I'm trying to help her. She's very anxious. And we did this treatment. The angiogram looks great. Good job by me. And so trying to be a good clinician, I said, let me follow you up for every few years. I'll arrange MRI scans. I'll examine you. We'll talk. So here I got an MR in 2018, right after the treatment. 
You can see the susceptibility caused by my flow diverting stent and everything's looking good. Now, I may make a lot of mistakes. I'm certainly deeply flawed and imperfect like all of us are. But we can try to overcome our own insufficiencies by being honest and confronting ourselves about them. So I know that if I'm seeing the person in clinic, if I'm hyper-focused on my aneurysm treatment and result, that I may have blinders on to the rest of the image. The same way that if Saman goes on one day to be an oncologic neurosurgeon and resects a meningioma and sees this lovely lady back in clinic, he may be focused on his operative cavity, on the bed, is there a recurrence, and not be worried at all about the contralateral temporal lobe where there's some new signal abnormality. So when I order these MR scans as the ordering clinician, I make absolutely sure that it's never me as the primary person interpreting them because I don't want to get into A, any like, you know, so for example, financial ethical conundrums, but more important than that, I want to mitigate against my weakness and my bias as the treating clinician. And here's an example of how bad my bias can be. 2019, quick snapshot. 2020, quick snapshot. 2021, 2023. You might guys be wondering, why is he showing me snapshots up here at the third ventricle when the aneurysm was in ophthalmic aneurysm? Because look at the pineal gland. Here's a pineal gland in 2019, kind of big. Here it is in 2020, kind of bigger. By the way, guys, I didn't see this any time. Here it is in 2021, kind of bigger and with some enhancement back here. Here it is in 2023 way bigger and with radically abnormal enhancement. I missed it all five times. The radiologists reading it also happened to miss it, except on this fifth time. My senior most neurorad colleague is a guy named Dr. Donald Lee. He is an amazing neuroradiologist. He read this, he missed it but something stuck in the back of his head and he had an intuition. I think I might've missed something. He came back a few hours later to challenge himself. He jotted it down and said, let me go back a few hours later with a fresh eye. And then he said, oh, holy shit, I missed that thing. And then he went back. He was the one who reported it the past few years. So I think if it had just been me only reporting this, I might not have caught this till year 12, 13, 15. Dawn didn't catch it even, but at least it's on year four or five when it's really starting to act up and change. This is an example of even if you're very confident, you're like, I'm really good at the imaging. I know my stuff. You're not perfect. You're going to fail. And you want to practice in an environment and with enough control of your own ego that you can mitigate against your failures. In this case, before it gets radically further out of hand, we can initiate a referral to my colleagues in neuro-oncology and we can start to work it up and look elsewhere and see is this a primary malignancy of the pineal gland or a lesion from elsewhere. Okay, so, you know, I've covered this. So, guys, we're about an hour in now. Catch our breath for a second. My breath, really. We've talked about two big pictures. We talked about what the heck are the MR images that I pull up on packs and how do I decode them a little bit. Part two was so I think I'll just And if any of you are going to go on to be neuroradio, you realize there is at least a tiny value in not just thinking you're the smartest person on earth and working alone in an office somewhere. Hopefully, I've tried to convince you there is a much greater value from a collaborative approach. Let me stop here. Any pressing questions, anything that's way off the mark, anything you disagree with, agree with, 
Just a quick question, Dr. Pan, in the previous case with the progression of the five years, um, is it usually that, you know, you would label and measure the, the diameter of the lesion, or is it just eyeballing more gestalt? Like, what's the thought process and in sort of seeing it? Yeah, so I think, you know, you have a... I think it looked too big and abnormal, even from the beginning. That's a borderline thing. We wouldn't have done anything. We wouldn't have gone crazy with it in the first two, three years, four years even. By the time you're getting that much radically abnormal enhancement coupled with the absolute size growth, then you know this cannot be normal. This is something got to be pathologic in some way. So really what triggers it is the apps, the, the relative change in size. Your pineal gland is not supposed to be growing in size at this age, okay, really at all. And the radical change in the subjective contrast pattern or enhancement pattern. Those two things tip you over to knowing this is abnormal. Okay, let's stop now and take a totally different pivot for the kind of maybe our last 30-ish minutes together. Here, I wanted to show you guys some unusual stroke thrombectomy cases. This is not going to be 65-year-old M1 occlusion, dense left MCA syndrome. We did a thrombectomy. They got way better. We're awesome. That's very common now. You've all seen it wherever you work. You've all been exposed to it. You all know thrombectomy standard of care. But my hope for all of you as a new generation of neurosurgeons is that you feel that thrombectomy is part of the core competency of a neurosurgeon. Even if you don't go on to do endovascular, that you don't feel out of water or not in place in that world. You are in place in that world. And that's why I show you some fringe odd cases so that you understand this won't be like this forever, but at least today in 2023, these are the edges of thrombectomy and where there's new and exciting things happening. Okay. And these are all patients that were like my patients or patients from London. 58 year old female was on a flight from Europe, got home, kind of a funny story, I guess, gets into a big argument with her spouse when she gets home. And she says, you're a jerk. I'm going to go spend the night in the car. So she sleeps in the car after taking this long flight. In the morning, her daughter goes to check on her. The woman's not speaking and has a totally flaccid right arm. The daughter says, oh, my God, mom, what's going on? Calls the ambulance. She gets rushed to the hospital. Here's the first wrinkle. She gets here. Her NIHSS is zero. She's got some cramping pain in the right leg, but she's speaking fluently. The right arm is normal. What do we do now? She was a smoker. She's had this colporophy in the past. So she stays in our department in the eMERGE, followed by the stroke team. NIHSS is staying at zero for over an hour. We check her blood pressure. She's normotensive now. She was normotensive even when she was in the ambulance. We say, hey, why don't we get you up out of bed and start walking you around? Maybe we can cause the symptoms to come back. No change. Let's look at the images non-contrast CT images I've shown you at the ganglionic and supra ganglionic levels to show you the aspects would be really good here. There's no other diagnosis like a big brain tumor or massive hemorrhage. Things are looking great. Let's look at the CTA. CTA, damn. There's an abrupt clue segment. So we've got a patient. We have no idea about the timeline she slept in the car. She's got a bad occlusion in a place that would be devastating to most people, M1 dominant hemisphere. She had symptoms, but she's completely normal now. So if I go racing in there, I can never make her better than she is now. What do we do? Collaterals look good. So here are the main considerations and debate points in a case like this. Should we just admit them to our unit? Should we race up and do a thrombectomy? Does it make any difference that this is her dominant hemisphere versus non-dominant hemisphere? 
these are kind of fringe questions in front of us right now. I don't know if, you know, maybe in the chat here, I see, I see Muhammad Tarek, you're an avid chat user. I love your uh, commitment to this. Uh, are you guys aware of any kind of uh, ongoing trials to kind of address this sort of topic in a patient like this one? So actually, uh, I suspected ICAT because of the fluctuation in the symptoms and the NIH. And actually, there is a trial like the in the low, it's an ongoing trial. So yeah, so it, it's for the low NIH, like uh, um, large vessel occlusion, it's still like um, no, like... Um, um, it's like, a great answer. Yeah. So, it's a great, yeah. Endo low would be a common yeah. trial, probably wherever you all are in the country. I'm not going to say all of you, but probably many of you are sitting at an institution right now that is participating in endo low, like we are in London, for example. Uh, now, this patient may or may not uh, qualify for endo low, of course, Mohammed, because yeah. the um, you do, you still don't want it to be, uh, you know, the zero thing, you can still enroll them, but the timeline would be another issue. But yes, endo low, great example. Of course, it's not the only trial examining this. But so in this case, let me show you what we did. We talked to the team. We talked to the patient. We debated. This was just before we were in enrolling site for Endolo. So I could not randomize this patient. I took this type of an approach, a sheath, a balloon guide catheter, and a stent retriever. Here's a pre and a post thrombectomy image showing the occlusion. And then on a lateral projection showing how things improved. Thank God. When you take a patient like this, you're very anxious because you're thinking one dissection, a tear, a rupture, and I've made this person way worse when they started off completely normal. But thankfully, the patient remained asymptomatic. Now, remember, they were on a flight for a long time. They slept in the car. They had cramping in their leg. During the admission, we found out she had pulmonary emboli and she was started on anticoagulation and fortunately discharged home. Here's what her MRI looked like. She of course has some signs of stroke on this diffusion weighted image, AKA ISO, AKA diff. I just want you to hear it again and again and again so you're comfortable with it. And we see this very commonly that where there's some perforators, there's not a lot of collaterals to help out in the lentiform nucleus. She suffered a small infarct there, but she tolerated that quite well. In addition to endolo, which Mohammed highlighted for us, most is also a trial running out of France. I don't believe there's North American recruitment in that trial, more or less examining the exam patient or population. So while we're now all enrolling in these and we're trying to get some good randomized data, what can we learn from the non-randomized data that exists to this point? Here's two papers that I thought might be of interest to you guys. One is just a basic summary from JNIS. That's the top one. The bottom one is a more interesting review of actual cases that was published in neurology in 2020. So if we look at that bottom one, what they did was they pooled a bunch of co prospectively collected data to get to about 230 patients that might match this. About 140 of them went on to get EBT and about 100 roughly were just not managed medically. The interesting thing is that there is no statistically significant difference in that group, but there was a 22% higher risk of early deterioration in the thrombectomy group. Still, even with that, the long-term 90-day neurological outcomes are not statistically significant between either group. So it makes you wonder, maybe we're hurting more people with a thrombectomy, but maybe even accounting for that, there's some group we might actually be helping with the thrombectomy and it's all kind of coming out in the wash. So these trials are gonna to try to help address that. And you can imagine it's very stressful thing sometimes to randomize a dominant hemisphere M1 to not get an intervention and just hope that, gosh, I hope it doesn't happen that at three in the morning, you become densely hemiplegic and aphasic, um, you know, which does sometimes happen. So just an illustration of these fringe cases where the target is obvious, the target in any other scenario would be obvious what to do, 
but the target is not matching how good the patient is. And that's an active area of question. Let's look at a different type. 46 year old, young guy, sudden onset of left weakness, fell to the ground at four in the morning, was also in an argument with his family, interestingly. Got to the hospital, has a fairly low NIHSS, but it's not zero. In this case, it was four. Now, when we go to the medical history, methamphetamine user, currently using, had a bad ischemic cardiomyopathy because of the meth use. Long time opioid abuser, currently on methadone. Active smoker, has this JAK2 positive thrombocytosis, has all these pain syndrome in the legs. I'm thinking this guy is not healthy. This might be a nightmare of a situation. Let's look at the images. Same thing, ganglionic, superganglionic CT. Aspects, some signs of stroke already on the right side, but it's not massive. CTA, I'm showing you a big thick MIP so that it's easy for you to see. Boom. There's an occlusion of the M1 segment of the right MCA. Here's the collaterals. They don't look too bad. So to me, hey, we're going to go do a thrombectomy. In our center, we do collat multi-phase collaterals and we do CT perfusion on every patient. Huge perfusion mismatch between the transit time and blood volume. Okay, let's do it. He's early on. He's less than three hours out because remember this all happened at four in the morning. So he gets IVTPA from my colleagues. We're setting up the angio suite. This was the approach that I used and the equipment that I used. There's the occlusion. Here it is on a lateral view. You can see these collaterals, guys. This is a good example for all of you if you haven't seen it yet. There should be filling in this area. And this is an example of how the brain helps itself out. Here's the ACA. And over the leptomeningeal surface of the brain, the ACA is providing retrograde collaterals that cascade down to help the MCA, to let the MCA survive for a while. So we do the thrombectomy, and here's the result at the end. The patient improves to an IHSS of just one for very mild facial droop. I'm thinking, thank God. Get this person back up to the stroke unit. Maybe this is a wake-up call for this poor gentleman. Maybe he can overcome some of these devastating personal lifestyle and substance abuse and addiction issues. Five and a half hours later, I'm moving on with my day. It's the afternoon. Damn it. Phone call. And it says, hey, he's worse than he was before. He's got a dense hemiplegia. His NHSS is up to 15 now. Let's get another scan. Okay, thank God he's not hemorrhaged after the thrombectomy that I did, thankfully. But guess what? The M1 is occluded in the exact same place now. So now here's where I start to think to myself, what's going on? Did he throw an embolism to the exact same place? Do I bring him back for EBT? If I do that, do I use the same approach or different materials and equipment? Is this really embolic disease to the same site every time? Or I know this guy's doing a lot of active substance abuse. Maybe he's got some pathology in the arterial wall itself. Maybe that part of the artery is diseased. If that's the case, do I need to stent this person acutely to hold it open? These are the things weighing through my head and I'll be honest and vulnerable with you guys. I don't know what the right answer is. So I say, I'm a limited person with limited tools. I can try to fix some problems and some things I don't understand. So let me go up and do another thrombectomy. We have to try to help this man. We do the thrombectomy, we open the artery up again, thank goodness. Ultimately though, he had a very minimal improvement after these extra hour or two with the bad symptoms. The poor gentleman is now wheelchair dependent. He can stand up and transfer to toilet or bed, but it's a devastating situation. So when I look back to the literature and say, what lessons can I learn from other people as well? I can see, hey, here's a nice paper from Stroke featuring one of our former fellows, a neurosurgeon, uh, to say, hey, what about recurrent endovascular thrombectomy 
a repeated thrombectomy, sorry, from recurrent occlusions. So they combined data from six institutions in that stroke paper and got 3,000 patients. Out of those 3,000, almost 2% needed to come back for repeat thrombectomy. And what come back, they, when they go through those, they ascribe the causes. They believe majority were still cardioembolic disease. And still, even of those coming back, a tiny minority are they ascribing to intracranial athero. And the majority tend to occlude again at the same site. And a large percent of these patients are ending up with a pretty bad outcome. Let's look at a different case here. 72-year-old. In July, the patient went to the immersion department for episodic confusion, dysarthria, dizziness, and some left vision loss. I'm showing you guys this case because this is an example of something that without my, my cherished colleagues in neurosurgery, I would have never been able to tackle or think of a case like this. So keep this in mind. Symptoms resolved in the eMERGE. Great. But then this poor man has this incredible partner in his life. She watches him like a hawk. And he has five more episodes in the next six days where he's becoming blind and incoordinated. He might have had a stroke. The family's not sure. He's very bradycardic. And he's a severe, severe vasculopath. He's had femoral endarterectomies, fem fem bypass, dyslipidemia, hypertensive smoker. Let's look at his pictures. Hey, he did probably have a stroke. He's got a little lacoon in his left thalamus. He's got a lot of volume loss in his head here. Let's look at his CTA together, guys, and we'll go through it carefully. Here's each common carotid artery where my mouse is. As we scroll up, you can see the left common carotid artery is really small. Remember, that's where he's having the vision loss. Let's look at the left side first. Thick, thick calcium and non-calcified plaque at the carotid bifurcation. On the right side, not that bad right now. But now look what happens as we go up the left side first. Tight stenosis at the origin of the external carotid and complete occlusion of the internal carotid. All he's got on the left side is this tiny little white dot of the external carotid. That's it. Let's look on the right side now. All he's got there, again, very severe, severe stenosis of the ICA. So this poor man is hanging on by a thread. Severe stenosis of the ICA on the opposite side. Occlusion of the ICA on the ipsilateral side. And severe stenosis of the ipsilateral external carotid. This guy's in a tough spot. Look at the ICA as we get to the head. It's reconstituted here, but man, that thing is tiny. That's not big enough to supply a whole part of the brain. Here's the same thing just from some different angles, okay? Showing how heavily calcified it is, how severely narrow the external carotid is on that side. And then here's what the plaque looks like on the right side with that tight stenosis. So here's the summary. So the initial plan, and, the, and meanwhile, this family is incredibly hesitant to risk any kind of new stroke on the right side of the brain because they're so scared of the deficits he's had on the left side. So they, he comes to our carotid clinic. They say, get on dual antiplatelets. Let's put you on high-dose statins. Come to our carotid clinic urgently. So he's in the carotid clinic, and he's seen by my cherished colleague in neurosurgery, Dr. Victor Yang. Victor sees him with our fellow. When they raise the patient out of a chair, right in front of their very eyes, the patient becomes completely blind in the left eye, totally weak on the right side, NIHSS of seven. They lie the patient right down flat, NIHSS goes back to zero. Victor says, uh-uh, we're not playing around with this as an outpatient. Let's admit them right now to the stroke unit. We get an MRI on that same time. Thankfully, there's been no acute stroke. Remember, the symptoms resolved. So ultimately, after a few days in the stroke unit, the patient gets discharged home and they're doing quote unquote fine. But then guess what? They call us freaking out. One week later, he goes to stand up from dinner. He goes blind again. This is no way to live. 
So what do we do here? We think we've maxed out the medical management. Should Victor go in and do an endarterectomy on the good side, hoping that it might augment flow to the bad side? Should I go and do a stent on the good side? Maybe it might augment flow to the left. But the patient is saying, I'd rather die than risk losing this side of my body also. Should Victor go do a radial harvesting and a high flow bypass? But there's so much disease here, he's going to have to do his bypass low down in the common carotid. That's a big surgery for someone who's such, in such bad health. Or should we think of something novel that we could only come up with together? And that's, of course, what we chose to do. We said, hey, most people can have a chronically occluded internal carotid, and they get a lot of collateral from the other side, and they get a good collateral from the external carotid. This guy's got a severe stenosis of the external carotid. Maybe the safest thing I can do and not expose him to new stroke in the brain is try to open up the external carotid and buttress his collateral flow to the brain. And so that's the approach we take. Here's the angiogram. Look how unbelievably tiny and narrow that external carotid is at its origin. And when I do, and look at all the collateral pathways it's developed. I'm highlighting with my arrows to try to struggle to get back to the external carotid and ultimately get a little collateral up to the brain. Here's the same thing on the opposite view. So here you can see I'm trying to thread a wire across there as best as I can. Ultimately able to get a balloon across there, the external this is. There you can see I'm inflating the balloon and you can see there's a tight narrowed waist on that balloon right where the arrow is. And then if we keep pushing that balloon, we get it to pop open. And now look what it looks like. Now I can take a picture and immediately I can see collateral going to the internal carotid where my mouse is. So we've now regained flow to this person's internal carotid. And look, from the external injection, I'm seeing the whole MCA start to show up now. Of course, we're not the people to invent this. I found this beautiful paper from colleagues in Chicago in Journal of Neurosurgery in the mid-2000s looking at external carotid angioplasty to augment flow to the intracranial part of the brain. Thankfully, the person has had total stopping of these brain drain symptoms. He's lasted now, now he's lasted more than four weeks, no of these symptoms, which are happening at a frequency of close to one every other day before that. We don't know long-term if he's gonna hold up, but we're gonna see. So again, thinking about stroke, beyond the conventional ways. Here's a fascinating case. Found a 61-year-old, eight in the morning, left weakness, bad NIHSS, previous uh, smoker. You can see here's what the brain looks like. And here's what it looks like as we follow it up on a CAT scan. There's a tight, tight stenosis here in that right ICA very tight stenosis and an occlusion intracranially. So a tandem set of disease, blockage here, occlusion here. In the literature right now, there's a big debate about how do we handle this? Do we deal with neck first, open it up and then get up and deal with the brain? Do we deal with the brain first? And I think most of us would feel, even though there's a lot of debate, that dealing with the brain first probably makes the most sense. That's the thing that's ultimately the end organ of interest. And if you deal with the neck first, you might be wasting precious time. So we decided, let's go on, let's do a thrombectomy. And I wanted to show you this because it's an interesting kind of uh, paper we've uh, submitted. Uh, we try to take an approach in London of saying, don't deal with the neck first, don't deal with the brain first, deal with both of them simultaneously. And here's how we do that. We call it the most technique. Basically, we don't try to pass a huge catheter across this tight blockage. If we can, we can, great. But most of the time we can't. So in that case, we just pass the tiniest thing possible, a small microcatheter, get a, balloon, a stent retriever open in the clot in the brain. Most of the time with a stent retriever, you want to leave it in place for four to five minutes 
to incorporate the clot before you pull it out. So during those four to five minutes that you're waiting anyways, we then rapidly advance a balloon over the wire of the stent retriever. That's called monorail technique. Do a quick angioplasty in under a minute or two. And in that way, address the neck stenosis while we're simultaneously addressing the brain stenosis. So there's a stent retriever that I've opened up in this person's brain. And at the same time, here's a balloon that I'm doing in the neck. The stent retriever has to stay there for three to five minutes anyways. So doing the plasty simultaneously allows you to leverage time that you would have been waiting either way. So we call this the most technique. And then later on, if you want to go back and put a carotid stent or do more aggressive plasty, you can do so you have the luxury of time. Here's an example of the figure from our description of this, I'm just showing you in a cartoon schematic, the simultaneous balloon angioplasty and, and intracranial thrombectomy. Last case I'm gonna show you guys is an interesting case, again, that's only possible if you have the great fortune of being in a neurosurgical and neuroradiology collaborative environment. This is a case with Steve Lowney when he was still here in London. 64 year old woman, right facial droop, word finding difficulties, went to an outside hospital, got kind of better, then got worse. So got came to UH, hypertension, dyslipidemia, smoker, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> NIHSS 14 for these points. There's an occlusion of the M1 segment. We got to do a thrombectomy for this person. But guess what? They have horrible, horribly calcified plaque in the neck. Now in London, we do a lot of carotid stenting. Maybe one of the busier centers in the country for that. I probably 50 to 60 carotid stents per year in our practice. The reason we do more than maybe other centers is because of work done by Dr. Lowney and Dr. Pals before me, where they have developed a score called the plaque score to try to triage which plaques might respond better to stenting versus thrombectomy. And one of the lessons we learned from that score is that densely calcified plaques, this is kind of obvious, are really a pain for putting carotid stents into. But in this case, it's an emergent thrombectomy. We don't have time to do an end arterectomy first. We got to do that thrombectomy now and just deal with it. So my colleague goes in and does this. This is Michael Manch's endovascular case. He does a plasty in the same setting. He deploys a stent because the, once he got the brain open, the neck just wasn't holding open. He had to stent it emergently. Here's what it looked like. Before the stent on your left, after this angioplasty, and once the stent goes in. Now, the problem when you put these stents in is if the patient was not on antiplatelets ahead of time, you have to load them emergently. And there is always some risk that the patient may be in a thrombogenic state and may acutely clot off the stent. So guess what? The patient did great, improved early on. And then what happened the very next morning while they were being rounded on by our stroke team starts to fluctuate and then densely becomes hemiplegic again. We raced them down and got a quick ultrasound within minutes. And look what we see. We see clot all through that stent. So if you're a radiologist, you're on your own. You only have one approach left now. Go back, try to pull that clot out from an endovascular standpoint, knowing that it's a shitty, densely calcified plaque, and it's never going to look much better than it does now. If you have a collaborative environment, you can also pick up the phone and call Steve Lowney and say, hey, can I pitch a crazy idea to you? Do you want to go to the OR in the next 10 minutes and try to do an emergent stentectomy and endarterectomy, knowing that if I go endovascular, it's not going to be much better than this, and maybe we can do it together? And so when you have a great colleague, he's, this is the plaque score paper, by the way, guys, from Journal of Neurosurgery you have that option. Here's the video from this case. I figured you guys are a bunch of young neurosurgeons to be. You're going to be bored if I don't show you an operative video, okay? 
So on the right side of the screen is the patient is the clamp and the common carotid. At the top of the screen is a temporary clip going up to the brain. Here you can see exposing the carotid artery and you can see the stent inside of there, okay? And look at all the clot sitting inside that stent. So that's the proximal part of the stent that's now exposed. And now Dr. Lowney is gonna say, let me work up and free up the superior part of the stent. I'll just skip ahead. There's a the superior part of the stent. And look at that disgusting plaque all ensnared and tangled in there. That's the part that we would not be able to fix from an endovascular standpoint. So Dr. Lowney says, okay, let me pull out the stent. It's only been in there less than 24 hours. You can see there he's grabbing it, getting ready to yank it out. And once it's out, then we can do a thrombectomy. Now we know there's a lot of clot here. And we know, as he does the end arterectomy, that we're there with him. So once he's got that plaque delivered from the end art, and when we want to see how much clot was extending up towards the brain, here you can see we're taking a combined approach. As he's getting ready to release that temporary clip on the brain, and we're not getting a lot of bleeding back down from the brain, he can say, why don't we put up an aspiration catheter and do an open surgical ex exposure for an endovascular uh, aspiration thrombectomy? So here we're threading up a penumbra aspiration catheter, connecting it to our pump, dragging out some clot, and we'll take a few passes that way until look what we start to see. After the second pass, boom, now it's bleeding back. Now we've got the clot out from the head. And now we can turn our attention to the lower part of the carotid. And here you can see as we drag that clot out, here we can just drag it out mechanically. Boom, it's opened. Now the vessel's open. So an example of a patient who needed an endovascular treatment emergently, a thrombectomy. We did it. We did our best. And when we're confronted with a co complication the next day, we can either just keep doing the same thing over and over again, or if we're lucky enough to be in an environment with people like all of you, we can go past that and think outside of the endovascular suite. Here's the clot and here's the stent. This is not possible if I work on my own if I don't have a colleague that I can trust and turn to in times of trouble. Here are the pre-clamp, post-clamp near scores. Here's the total clamp time. And the patient ultimately made it to dis, uh, rehab and ultimately did make it back home. Just so you know, guys, even though this is a cool modern idea, don't forget that every new idea was already existed. Here's Dr. Welch from 1955 talking in Denver about doing an excision. That was a patient who was in their 20s who had had an occlusion for 20 days already before he did the thrombectomy. The famous Bennett Stein, a legendary neurosurgeon from Boston in the 70s, reviewed every case published to that point. And there was only, I think, about 30 cases that had ever been published to that point, 12 of which were from the master, Dr. Yassergill, uh, of doing surgical embolectomies. And also, you guys should be proud that there's a Canadian history here. Dr. Redekop published an experience with Brian Drake of doing an embolectomy after a failed thrombectomy. That's a single one-off case report in 2010. And some of you guys may follow this group from Korea that's very provocative. These guys, reg these are neurosurgeons that regularly do so-called minimally invasive embolectomies for acute M1 occlusions if it fails. They even operate if the patient got TPA. They do a superciliary keyhole craniotomy, apply a temporary clip, and make as small an incision on the M1 as is possible, typically three to four millimeters. And because they're trying to operate fast and get the vessel perfused again, they don't suture up their hole in the M1 in the MCA. They just put a longitudinally oriented clip along it. I saw them present some of their early data uh, at a meeting, I think maybe four or five years ago. 
their times are unbelievable, but obviously this is a pair, fairly niche technique. Uh, I think it's pretty unlikely that this would become widespread. So let me stop here. We have about 15 minutes left if there's any questions. Otherwise, I'm sure everybody's hungry and has a life to get to. Number one, I'm extremely grateful to get to spend time with all of you. We're all going to be colleagues. I hope we're all going to be friends. Canada is a small place. And so to get a chance to know you on your ascent to fame and stardom and helping people, it's a privilege for me. So thank you. In terms of the substance of it, we covered those three pillars of the imaging, decoding it a little bit, some interesting neurosurgical cases, and then a look at the edges of the frontiers of thrombectomy. And I tried to come back and back and back for the 50th time to the same principles of collaboration with neuroscience is helpful. These are my colleagues that I work with in the neurovascular suite and in the operating rooms, a long line of spectacular fellows that I have a very, very lucky to get to work with and a picture of some of us here. Here is my email address. If there's ever a way I can be helpful or supportive to you all in your ascent or your career, don't think twice to call me, ask someone for my contact information or a bra or whoever it is. Uh, and thank you guys. I appreciate it. Dr. Pandy, this is one of the best stuff you've ever had at games like and in three years you've been in operation. So thank you so much. It's been very thorough, very exciting. And we really appreciate this. Would you also be comfortable sharing some of the slides with us in case some members are interested or would there be some disclosure associated with that? I got no problems with it at all. This is all my uh, okay. stuff. I haven't sort of taken things from anybody. So uh, yeah, for sure. I don't mind it. I assuming of course that, you know, that you you guys kind of keep have some reason of course just for the members here yes. exactly yes. yeah no no exactly. it's fine i don't mind fantastic uh, thank you thank you so much dr Vande. it's a really informative lecture and uh, actually although my my background it's like interventional vascular and intervention neurology but i really like it so much i'm actually doing a new endovascular research fellowship here at emory university in atlanta so so yeah, so actually for the last case, I have a question, small question. So uh, did you think about like intravascular uh, uh, trip through Lysi, like for like, there's some case reports about like for the calcific like uh, carotids. Um, so they just introduced like a balloon and then like give like a shock wave to try to to overcome those like uh, calcification in the carotids. So did you yeah, think, I think I think it's a great idea, Mohammed. And as as you we we know a little bit about this, as we do in many things, you must know this very well. We um we know a little bit about this in particular from the cardiac literature, right? So okay. even though we like to act okay. like we're fancy, we have to also be humble and remember that a lot yeah. of neuroendovascular progress is kind of riding a little bit of coattails or taking inspiration maybe from the exactly. cardiac. Yeah, yeah, all right. And so they're a little bit ahead of us on some of this endovascular lithotripsy. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that is a good idea. I think we could also say though, that we're at the very forefront of it and we have no idea what is the overall kind of efficacy, safety at a broad level for neuro applications. There's yeah. just not enough use of it anywhere in the world yet. But if we look ahead and say, what do the next 15, 10 years look like? My suspicion is that we might go past these things like that plaque score that I told you, just looking at a CT scan. Exactly. That's a great idea. But probably better than that would be developing the OCT version of a plaque score or starting to use more IVIS, you know, intervascular ultrasound. Yep. OCT may be difficult because carotid bifurcations are big. And OCT works for very small things with incredible resolution. OCT guys is optical coherence tomography. Again, widely used in the coronary world, just now in the early years of adaptation to the neuro world for various reasons. But it's going to be a big thing for us as we look forward. Um, so I think we may start to use OCT, conventional CT, 
ultrasound, intravascular ultrasound, and together with all of those, maybe develop a more complicated way of deciding who needs aggressive angioplasty? Who might need some lithotripsy? Who is better with just a primary stent and not adding all these extra complicating things? Who should you just give up and not even bother? Just go do the damn endarterectomy. So we still don't know at a great level for individual patients how to triage. And my suspicion is those might be some of the tools we'll try to help answer those in the future. And I think it's good of you to raise them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The, so I think it's going to be like a tailored treatment for, for each group, such as you mentioned before. So, uh, yeah, we are going to see like, uh, yeah, it's actually the field is rapidly progressive. So we are going to see like a lot of things like happening soon, like with those trials as well, like for the large core, I think the guidelines are, are going to change as well. So yeah, let's see. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernie. So. It's my pleasure to be here with you guys. So, Happy to hang, happy to keep chatting if there's anything to say, but if we think we're towards wrapping it up, then I'll let you go. I'm just taking a quick look back here through the uh, chat and I'm not seeing any burning questions. So I'll end with a final thank you and please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I wish you all the best of luck in your careers. Cheers. <laughs>